Greetings, brothers and sisters. Alec Baldwin sued by a family of late Rust cinematographer Halna Hutchins. Lawyers for Halna Hutchins family filed a wrongful death suit against Alec Baldwin while releasing a chilling video reenacting the movie set shooting that killed the cinematographer. So here it is. They're in the the church. Here's Alec. He's playing with his gun over here. Here's Halna Hutchins. They're all masked up. And he just, um, what they're saying happened is he just pulled the trigger and fired. Okay, so let's watch that again here. So it starts here. And this woman hands Alec the gun, right? And so this it disputes Alec's story, which was, I believe it was the assistant director or somebody, some dude who wasn't the armorer. I don't know if this is supposed to be the armorer. But this um, woman, and he said a man handed him the gun. Neither one of them checked the gun. So Alex takes the Alex takes the gun and sticks it in his coat. So I don't know if there's a holster there. I mean, so that he's putting that in his holster. And he sits down here, looking very menacing. They've, uh, <laughs> he's got his gun ready to go here. And so they're messing around. Alec is sitting here. They're messing around with um, the camera, maybe getting the camera set right, whatever, lighting. And so they've got the hand camera at it, pointed at Alec. And so now here they are, and here's Alec. And he pulls out his gun. And again, his thumb isn't on the... <laughs> he just fires, right? So she wasn't giving him any direction. What he said happened was Halna Hutchins was standing here and she said, move your gun here, move your gun here. And they were looking at the camera, trying to get the camera angles right and all these things. And she was giving him directions. And again, there's no talking in this video, but what they show completely disputes what Alex said about him pulling back his hammer at her instruction and that he was... Um, was making, like, he just pulled out the gun and shot her. That's what they're saying. And, you know, is there video proof here? Did they, was the camera on? Do they have evidence? Did they see the video, the, the film? Or, you know, what else is there? What do other witnesses say, right? But what they're saying is he just pulled out his gun and shot at her, right? Maybe he was joking around. Maybe who knows what, you know, his motivation was. But their story differs completely from Alex, right? And this is bad news for him. So I made a, an Alec and Hilaria video. I was just editing it and re getting ready to render it and putting it up on YouTube earlier today. And then this news broke. And so, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm including this in here too because it's, you know, kind of important. This is a day that I um, was kind of happy this morning when I woke up and realized I didn't have to cover Alec Baldwin or um, Bob Saget. And then... <laughs> There's been two things worth covering today, and I get into this in about a, a comment I got about Alec Baldwin as well. Um, and so that video I made earlier earlier will start now. So I got a couple of great um, comments, <laughs> That one that pertains directly to this. Um, I talked about how I was relieved or felt good that I wasn't making a, a Bob Saget or Alec Baldwin video today. But one of my viewers sent me this, right, this photo of them on uh, Valentine's Day. And she said he looked like, you know, I mean, so disheveled and he looks so homeless. He's really falling apart. And I don't know if there's some guilt going on and, you know, what's eating away at him. Certainly being married to her isn't helping him. But he's like snoozling and sniffing her hair and, you know, doing the old Jojo Magoo stuff. And she says, we rallied, gave him a card. And that will make more sense when you see this post. This is um, well, it has, says here, I looked back on my phone today to see if I had any pics of our first Valentine's Day together. It's this one and a photo of Penela pre-children. I don't know what that is. I didn't take many pics. We had been together four days shy of a year, four days shy of a year. You were shooting 30 Rock 
she's sending an open letter here. She's writing to Alec Baldwin. This is like something that she's writing to him, but she's doing it on Instagram. Like they don't have email or they don't have personal messages, right? She's sharing this with everybody, which is weird on Instagram. You know, to send a direct message out to all of your Instagram followers. And it says, um, you were shooting 30 Rock, called me, asked me if Valentine's Day was a big deal for me. I said no, because, well, I'm sometimes robotic in romantic swing of things. Such a rational Capricorn. <laughs> I'm softening and learning. We agreed we were both working late and we would skip it. Then you picked me up from work teaching yoga <laughs> and said you had a surprise, brought me for my homie comfort food, got me an amazing present and a beautiful card. Then you asked, where is my card? And I'm like, um, remember, we weren't celebrating. I mean, it sounds like he's kind of, you know, it's that's kind of a woman like that's it's like roles are reversed here, right? where he asked her if it was a big deal. She said no. And then he asked for, and then he said, oh, let's not celebrate. And she said, okay. And then he brought her out and then brought her a card and said, where's my card? Right? I'm like, um, remember we weren't celebrating. You told me that it was unacceptable and you had an extra card at home that I could fill out for you when we got home. Yikes, Alec Baldwin. I obviously refused because... That felt fake. And, you know, she doesn't like to be fake. <laughs> fake, 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 fake. She doesn't like to have a fake Instagram page and a fake accent. And the next day I went to CVS and brought every single corny and ridiculous card I could and decorated the apartment. You came in and I thought you'd laugh. You cried and said it was the most beautiful and romantic thing ever. Cue me feeling awkward. Robot hilaria. I learned you are an emotional, I learned that you are emotional and romantic and I've never forgotten a card since because it is meaningful to you and you are meaningful to me. See my stories for weirdness I recreated for the February 15th, 2012. Um, so that explains we rallied and I gave him a card. So first I want to talk about Valentine's Day. You know, it's weird posts. She always has weird posts. And that's kind of like intimate details. And why share that on Instagram? Like she's trying to humanize him. I mean, you know, he shot somebody and she faked an identity. Like, oh, they have goofy Valentine stories. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you can't humanize Charles Manson, right? You know, like or whatever. Once your brand is damaged in such a way. But anyways, I don't like these kind of days. Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, anything like this. Veterans Day. I mean, these one days that people have, you know, and I can understand the holiday aspect of it. And, you know, Veterans Day is a little bit different because it's a national thing. But Father's Day, Mother's Day, and Valentine's Day is a day that you're supposed to express love and appreciation for your significant other, your mom, or your dad. And, you know, you should do that regularly, like every day. Like I express my love and affection to my wife. She expresses her love and affection to me every day, right? Like, we don't need a Valentine's Day. And some days are just more special and, you know, more romantic or more connected than other days. And those days are just, you know, they happen in the natural flow of things. And so what these days do usually point out you have a lack of something. Like if your relationship sucks and your relationship is, you know, on Valentine's Day, then you're going to, it's going to stand out to you, right? the lack of love, the lack of affection, the lack of romance or passion or these things that are in your life. And if you're alone, it's even more so. And, you know, my wife and I went out to eat for Valentine's Day last Thursday. I don't know what Valentine's Day was. Was that Saturday? Was it? Um, yeah, it was um, yesterday. <laughs> and so I said, happy Valentine's Day. She had forgot all about it. But we went out Thursday because we knew everybody would be out eating especially like a post Super Bowl day on top of it. And, you know, all the restaurants, it's just, you know, amateur night. Like I, like I said, when I was, you know, years ago when I went to bars, I didn't like to go out on New Year's and, you know, it was just everybody was out and it was, you know, it's just forced and contrived. I mean, these special days that holidays always come with, 
expectations and then disappointment that you didn't meet those expectations, right? You know, I've said this before, when I did the heartfulness gatherings, we went to these heartfulness birthday celebrations for the masters of the system, and there wasn't gifts or presents and things like this. It was just meditation and transmission. And it was phenomenal on just how I felt inside, right? And, you know, any of these gatherings, anytime I've gone to an ashram or something, it always has exceeded my expectations. I've talked about the the last gathering, which is like was the exception. But it always, you know, always left better than I would imagined I would have, right? Just how I felt inside. And I, I couldn't recreate even, you know, how, how good it feels just from memory, right? It was a an experience. And it had nothing to do with, you know, materiality. So that's what it made it beautiful. Something material didn't have to happen to make it a good experience, right? Like all these pictures people put on social media trying to, you know, validate their experience. See, look at how great my life is. Or look how happy I am by this picture. It shows you. Well, yeah, maybe it does. Or maybe it's just some fake ass whatever, right? But if you have to convince me you had a great time, then you probably did. You know, <laughs> you know that's what social media is. Like trying to, you know, show everyone else how great your life is or whatever, you know, is going on with you. Or, you know, maybe the opposite, depending on the person's perspective. But these days, you know, with Mother's Days and Father's Days, if you have a bad relationship with your mother or father or they've passed away or, you know, there's abuse in the situation, they're bad days, right? And, you know, if you're a father or mother and your kids end up not contacting you and, you know, whatever, they're mad at you and just these days just aren't good days, right? And so, if the, you know, if you have a good relationship, then there should be a celebration. If a person's a good person, you should tell them, right, somebody significant to you more than just some specific day. And Hilaria says she isn't into Valentine's Day, but everything about her Instagram page is that sort of a thing, right? It's doing things that everybody does, right? Just doing things like celebrating Valentine's Day is doing it because everyone says you're supposed to, right? And not saying, all right, why wait till Valentine's Day to express love and affection and gratitude and appreciation for your significant other or other people in your life or whatever it might be, right? Just let it happen spontaneously. And everything that she's saying in her post is, you know, the opposite of what she demonstrates and what Alec demonstrates on their Instagram pages where they're trying to appeal to demographics. It's all fake, you know, acting's fake, all these things. But anyways, I want to get to these comments because one came in, you know, I made this comment video and then I made a follow-up today because two of the commenters posted thoughtful comments clarifying their comments, right? And, you know, I did a follow-up video about that. And um, then when I was reading through the comments to that comment video, there was these gems. And the first one had to do with Alec and Hilaria. And so, um, see if I have the right one here. It's not it. Um, I enjoy listening to your channel, but dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Do you know how many videos you've discussed Alec Baldwin and how fake his wife accent is and how fake she is and all about her? Dot, 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 dot. Paul, your obsession with her is a little absurd. I thought you said you enjoyed watching my videos, right? This is a person, oh, I enjoy watching your videos, but, right? Your obsession with her is a little absurd and obvious. I would bet my entire life savings on the fact that you Google them today for an update every day. I used to enjoy these videos a lot more. Broaden your topics a little more, man. Okay, so are you going to give me your life savings? Because that's not the case at all. But before I get into this wonderful person, this other um, woman chimed in. Yes, I'm quite sure the first thing Paul does upon opening his eyes is to check up on Alex and wife. Bye. Go watch something else. Nobody cares. You're wasting your time. You're talking. You're taking up a common spot. You should leave the available for us folks that have at least a touch of uh, intelligence. I get it. You're probably a troll. At least be funny or entertaining. And then I didn't uh, click read more. And then someone else posted, don't you get it? He does not care about what you think. Either you get, get it or you go somewhere. He's not interested in your opinion. The thing is that this person who, you know, was willing to bet their life savings, 
could easily have figured out that there's another explanation. Like he can't think of any other explanation to why I make Alec and Hilaria videos. There's no other explanation, even when I've talked about it in various videos. And what's interesting about this, you know, for one, when I make a comment video, I'm saying all the time, this is there, I don't have a complaint department. So to this video that he's replying to, I don't have a complaint department. I'm not asking for feedback. I'm not asking for a critique. And if you do it, you're going to be banned. I've said this over and over again. And I don't know exactly all of his motivation, but if he is to be taken at his word, which of course, you know, <laughs> he's not really. But when he says this, let me find the comment here again. When he says, um, here, that's not the right comment. Here's the right one. When he says, um, I used to enjoy these videos a lot more, broaden your topics a little more, man. Like, I care about what he enjoys or what he doesn't. Like, it's about him. Like, it's about, you know, <laughs> it's a narcissism here. How does he perceive other people feel like him? Like, he's a little Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> these videos are, I'm tired. These videos of Alec and Hilary have grown tiresome. Please do, do better, man. You know, like... And so, you know, but there's other motivation here because some of it's just hostile. But this person, you know, wants to get under my skin. And you have a lot of people on the Internet and they, you know, they have various ways of doing it. You know, I told that first comment that came in. This is when I had maybe uh, a thousand subscribers. No, this is probably about 20,000 subscribers. And my channel was just getting popular, but I still, you know, I would get maybe 100 comments a day depending on the video. And this person wrote, I really enjoy, because originally my videos were all about my homestead and my kids milking cows and, you know, us doing things as a family. And he said, I really enjoyed your homesteading videos. But now I enjoy your complete mental breakdown as you dive into the world of conspiracy theories and paranoia, right? Like I, I'm paraphrasing. And then he said, but I only have concerns about how this is going to affect the well-being of your children. Right? <laughs> and, you know, because I saw through it, it didn't affect me. But the guy was trying to get into my psychological, you know, get under my skin and get into my head or whatever it is. Right. And create doubt and all these things. Because first he said, oh, I really enjoyed your videos before you were capable of good work. Right. And I liked your work then, but now you're gone crazy and your mental illness and I'm laughing at you. I'm here over here, LOL, and ha ha ha, look at how crazy this guy is. And I'm so much better than you, right? So it's like trying to ding up my ego. And then he's like, but then he's like, but what about your poor children? You're such a bad, you know? Like, <laughs> and it was like kind of wonderfully evil. And of course, if he was a good person, he wouldn't be laughing at my mental illness and at the same time be worried about my children, right? And so I've noticed over the years troll comments like this. And what this one is right here is when he says the word obsession, like I'm somehow obsessed with Hilaria Baldwin and I'm just pretending, you know, I'm like pretending that I don't like her, right? <laughs> you know? Like I'm some little ch kid or whatever throwing rocks at a girl that I really have a crush on. Like it's just, you know, like this is the kind of remedial psychological manipulation these trolls use like this is saying to you you're just some sort of stalker and it's a little uncomfortable how creepy it is that you go to her instagool page every day and you look at her instagool page which i don't because there is an easy explanation for my celebrity videos and i've hand fed it to everybody every once in a while i talk about it and just this morning when i was making a video on this channel I talked about how I was relieved I wasn't making an Alec Baldwin video or a Bob Saget video. Not that there's some horrible thing, but, you know, it gets old for me after a while. And so the other possible explanation that would be there, which most people would be able to figure out, if he had watched so many videos that he's sick of these Alec Baldwin ones, <laughs> and he wants some new con he's demanding some new content like he's my boss, right? But what I've said before was, you know, I was mad at God in a sense when I realized I was given this assignment to dive into not only politics and world events, but to celebrity culture, because to make a living and to reach more people and expand my you know, audience, I had to cover celebrity videos, which are the number one videos 
They've been the number one views that I get, the most interactive, the ones that bring in the most subscribers. They're the ones to keep the lights on. And I weave my spiritual teachings or the heartfulness spiritual teachings into these, you know, various videos, which people can benefit from them. And my first, you know, my big thing that I started with was just getting this idea out that God's inside of you. And I figure out something that's simple, but in a way brilliant, that the celebrity culture, because most people have a desire to be famous and be a celebrity, right? And or at least they're interested in the celebrity culture with the idea that these are the people that made it. These are the people that are successful. These are the people who matter. But what I've been able to do is demonstrate over and over again, these people are miserable, selfish. I mean, they're bad people for the most part inside. And they're miserable and fame and wealth hasn't made them happy or any of these things. And I contrast that with connecting to God internally, this idea that God exists inside of you, which most Americans never even thought of. I didn't understand this, this idea that God is in everything and everybody, and you can have a relationship with God, you can feel God's presence and love in your life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It's a matter of choice and, you know, forming and cultivating this relationship and the heartfulness system helps do this, right? And many people who have heard this from me have tried the heartfulness system and have benefited on an experiential level from this work, right? From this work being done. And the other thing I've explained about this is once I start covering a certain subject and topic, especially these celebrity ones that have a lot of, you know, a lot of information comes up about them. The news media stuff is a little bit more tricky because there's more restrictions around it and you know, it comes and goes. I mean, in terms of like these, they're not long lasting stories. People are interested in them for a day. The celebrity stuff, people are interested in them for weeks, months. I mean, people are still coming to my channel for Bob Saget stuff, right? Even though I want to move on, it's what I have to do. It's the, you know, it's the part of the job that's work, right? It's the part of the job that's, you know, financially and the channel oriented. And it's something I have to do to keep this, you know, going. Like I have to make money. I have to get, you know, I have to have some sort of income from my work here. And those are the videos that are going to provide the money so I can do the spiritual videos. Like, you know, you have these actors who say they do the big blockbuster Hollywood films so they can do the more artsy independent films, right? And so for me, it's the Hollywood celebrity videos that I have to do because that's what you all demand. That's what, you know, not every single one of you, but as an audience, that's what you demand, right? But in terms of me uh, checking their Instagram page, I only do it if I am looking for some sort of content. Once in a while, there's nothing happening in the news or people don't send me anything. Like, for example, this morning, one of my viewers sent me this link to Hilaria Baldwin's page. And so I hadn't looked at it. And, you know, since I made the last Alec Baldwin video, and I don't always look at it, look at these Instagram pages, on my own unless, you know, it comes to mind or I, oh, I haven't covered them in a while or like something's happening. Like right now I have Kanye West's Instagram page up because I made videos about the last couple of days, right? And he's going full Kanye. But I have so many tabs open, things I'm going to cover, things, you know, I might cover in some time, some things I want to research and look into. I've got two browsers and all these tabs. And, you know, I want to be able to see the tabs. So if I have so many open that, you know, I can't see what's, you know, what, what website the tab represents, I start closing things. And so I don't keep these things open. Like I'll keep Kanye's Instacool page up for a day or two until we see that he's not talking about Skeet anymore, right, Pete Davidson. And then I'll close that. And then someone will send me something or I'll see an article in the New York Post or something, you know, page six, and then I'll go to their page. But I was never interested in these kind of things in celebrity lives before. And I'm not interested in them now, only in the aspect of making videos about it and everything that I do here. Like if I didn't make videos, I would not look at any celebrity stuff at all. Like I have no interest in it. And I, you know, I pretty much be burnt out on it at that time. Like I, you know, I enjoy the videos. Like if I got to do it, I might as well enjoy them. I might as well make them f fun or whatever it is, right? Like I've made them good for me. So I enjoy making the videos, whatever they are. Like I'd like to move on to various other subjects myself. But these are the videos that keep the lights on. And for someone who's not contributing anything, this commenter and other complainers, right, they don't contribute anything. They don't, you know, send 
links to something that w- would be, you know, again, I have people send me things I would never cover, which isn't helpful either, right? But they don't send links or, you know, they don't do anything to help. They don't provide any, like, you know, donations or they don't share my videos. They don't do anything to help the channel go. But they have their complaints and demands, right? <laughs> you know, and so um, I thought it was interesting because of the fact that I just said those things this morning about Alec Baldwin and um, Bob Saget. And what happens is I cover a certain group of people, and this has happened before where people said, oh, you're obsessed with Michael Jackson. You're obsessed with um, Katy Perry. You're obsessed with, you know, whoever. I made a bunch of videos, like I made 10 or 11 videos in a week-long period because that's where the views were. That's what was interesting to people. Those were, you know, people were coming to my channel to watch those things, and there was something happening to make that, you know, happen, right? And then as soon as I was able to move on, I gladly moved on, which, you know, I will in this case. But there was enough information for this person not to make this comment, right? I mean, all the things I've just said, and, you know, of course I say over and over again, I don't welcome your complaints. I don't have a complaint department. I'm not asking for your suggestions. This isn't a democracy. I'm not asking for your feedback. And if you don't like it, leave, right? Like, it's just that simple. But even with all that, the person wrote this comment to a comment video. And again, you know, part of it is they just want to undermine my self-confidence or whatever it is, right? They want to change what I'm doing. You know, they could be somebody who's hired by, I mean, I don't think this is the case because my channel isn't significant enough in terms of the views to make a dent or any of these things, but it could be like, you know, Alec Baldwin. Is that you, Alec? Right. <laughs> and so here was the other comment. And this was interesting because I just had discussed this as well. So the person writes this, and it goes with the, the first commenter as well. If you worked in a treatment center, in air quotes, turning children into zombies, you are not, you are not much better than Bob Saget actually you're actually much similar actually much similar like this is the kind of i mean you know actually much did you go to like did you <laughs> and again from a dyslexic person you know i have my grammatical errors and i'm not a, a grammar police guy right but this person's coming in like a knower right this is a i know more than you you know whatever i'm like i know about your treatment center you're much similar to bob saget right <laughs> That was a long time ago. You don't he you don't see him still doing it. No better, do better. And he said, People can change, and I'm sure he has changed a lot. Nobody in this world is perfect. I'm definitely not, so I don't expect anyone else to be. You just compared me to Bob Saget, and then somebody comes in and said it was a long time ago, and you completely cave on your position. Like, you know, have a spine at whatever, right? Rehab is for quitters. So the ignorance level in some of these comments, right? And this goes with the first person's comment when they're totally wrong. And I just was talking about treatment centers in a video I've just put up on YouTube today, right? So this person didn't watch that video. And I talked about this is, you know, if you've heard that, I talked about this experience with this kid. His mom had abused him. I was talking about how we, you know, these kids were in the timeout rooms and I'd be doing the nine o'clock prayer. And when I was doing the prayer, he kind of got, you know, teary eyed. And I asked him what he wanted out of life. And he said, I just want a family that loves me. Right. I just told that story this morning. And this person, you know, because what I had said in the Bob Saget video is that these drugs, I work in these treatment centers and they would give these kids these antipsychotic drugs and these, you know, these sleeping medications. And it was like, like tranquilizers. I mean, these kids would turn into zombies. And he was making it sound like I, you know, was the one ma- turning them into zombies. Like that was my choice. I was in charge of all those things, right? And in validating the sacrifice and suffering I went through doing that job that helped make me into, you know, a person that knows a lot about the system. Because my years working as a counselor and working in the counseling field, I saw things and realized things about our system. And this person knows nothing about it. And I talked about this with all the QBs that would come in and say, oh, you're an enabler, you're a pedo enabler because you're not, you know, spreading our QB BS stuff that we're saying, right? So I actually worked in the field with kids who were termed sexually reactive and then later with teenage sex offenders. I worked as a counselor with the most undesirable population. Do you want to go work with sex offenders? Do you want to be around those people? 
you want to go into some treatment center with kids who have been sexually abused and have act out sexually? Would you want to do that job? Like, are you going to quit your job and go work with them, right? Or whatever you're doing, like, other than just sitting on a computer and making dumb comments, you know, like, <laughs> do you see what I'm saying here? Like, you know, you guys don't know, like you're judging something that you have no idea about, right? It's just like these liberal hippies that called all the soldiers coming back from Vietnam baby killers, right? And they're, you know, sitting now drinking their lattes in their cul-de-sac, you know, houses and all the stuff that this, you know, evil empire, our military industrial complex provides for them. And without wars, we don't, you know, have wealth. I mean, wealth and war are tied together with America. But you had all these, you know, fake do-gooders who would protest and throw things at returning vets and things. 18-year-old kids, most of them being drafted, who didn't even want to go to war, right? And so, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You don't know anything and you're having an emotional reaction and just coming from your own ignorance. And I mean, this is a huge problem in the truth community. And just like this bonehead with the Hilaria Baldwin obsession comment, there's a truth which I know and you don't, right? <laughs> from my experience, like I know more about this than you because I lived it and I'm living it now, right, by making these videos in terms of the Alec and Hilaria thing. And I lived it before when I worked at a treatment center. And so just so you know what a treatment center is, like you've obviously made something up because the guy put treatment center in air quotes. Years ago, I was waiting tables. And, you know, I waited tables for like seven or eight years, six or seven years. I don't know what it was. I traveled around, lived in the Virgin Islands. I mean, I had, you know, some adventures and I was able to live in cool places because waiting tables is um, waiting tables at places where people vacation is, you know, a good thing. Right. You know, it was fun at first, but at some point I needed to do something more significant. And I had quit college. I dropped out of college twice. So, you know, I, I was um, struggling, underachiever. And then I started the heartfulness system. At the same time, I was, uh, you know, I was already went back for my third attempt at college and I was getting my bachelor's, bachelor's degree in human services and I had an interest in psychology, right? And so I had, you know, taken a lot of psychological classes and things. And I was engaged to this woman. She was a nurse and she got into therapy. I got into therapy eventually. I found heartfulness and I was looking to do something more, right? And, you know, right before I graduated, I was in my last um, semester, I got a job at a treatment center and it was like two months after I started Heartfulness. So it was like a, a kind of interesting switch in my life. And so I went to interview at this place. Um, I was a little bit familiar with it and it was in an area uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, Basketball Hall of Fame is there. My older sister used to live there. I used to drive up from Connecticut. And, you know, so I knew the place and I was familiar with that area. And I went to interview and there's this nice older Italian guy you know, my last name's Romano and I look Italian, you know, I'm, I'm also Irish, Albanian and German, but, you know, people look at me as like I'm Italian. And he's like, Paisan, you know, like, <laughs> it's like a whole thing. But he's a nice guy. And he told me these were just some trouble kids. And I didn't know they were junior sex offenders because he didn't tell people that because they wouldn't have wanted to work with them. Right. I mean, it's, you know, a difficult population. And so I started to work in this unit and these were the worst kids. Their, you know, their files, their history, what they had behaved at in school, and they had acted out sexually and sexually offended other kids their age. These are little kids, 10 years old to 14 years old, right? These aren't even teenagers. And what they had done to other kids and the way they behaved, many of them had, you know, criminal records to one degree or another, and their parents were abusive. Many times their family members abused them. And they were just the worst kids that nobody would want to be around. Like you wouldn't want your kids hanging out with these kids. You know, other parents were complaining about these kids, right? And the school department or the social system took these kids away from their parents and their parents were, you know, horrible people, but they had, you know, been abused and they had, you know, they were whatever they were, right? And so when they were living with it at home with their parents, criminal activity was going on. I mean, there was a, a kid that came in, his younger brother, came to visit him, his younger brother had AIDS, and he was given AIDS by his parents, abusing him, right? They had trained their kids to, you know, service other people. They were pimping them out. And also they were like pickpockets, and I mean, just they were, you know, these kids were trained like little criminals, right? 
these kids were going to be in institutions probably for the rest of their life, either psychological institutions or criminal institutions, but they weren't people that were going to live productive lives. Nobody was ever going to love them, right? They were kind of unlovable, and they didn't have those kind of lives. They were mean-spirited, and they were, you know, the worst of the worst. Even criminals look down on sex offenders, and this is, you know, a lot of the criminal behavior comes from sexual abuse and things like this, right? And if these kids were left at home, they would just get more and more trouble. They would be out in the world, you know, doing bad things to other kids and, you know, learning to be criminals. And eventually they were going to end up in the criminal justice system. And so the social service department took them out and put them in foster care where they were often abused. And then eventually they were placed in treatment centers where they would act out and they would be violent and they'd break things and they would just, you know, they would flip out all the time. And so to control them, there was a staff psychiatrist that would come in a couple of times a month and give the kids, you know, zombifying drugs to keep them from acting out and being the horrible people that they were. So this is a treatment center, right? And there's people working in the milieu, like myself, who didn't you know, necessarily believe in psychological medications. But I knew if these kids weren't on the psychological medications, the treatment center wouldn't function because there would be complete chaos and riots and kids acting out all the time. They had, you know, they didn't have the ability to repress their emotions. And most of them were suffering from PTSD and other forms of, you know, traumatic uh, effects of trauma and abuse, right? And the other sad thing is they were getting therapy and they were learning how to be better people to some degree while being drugged up and being medicated. But as soon as they left the treatment center and they were, you know, out of government control, they were going to go off their medications unless they really like their medications, but they might not be able to get their medications anyway, right? Because they needed a psychological professional to prescribe them, right? So these kids were released from treatment centers all the time and they were, you know, off medications and didn't have anybody in their life that was stable. They were often suffering from poverty, right? And so, you know, I don't feel good about these treatment centers I worked at, but there is no other solution, right? And the lifespan, the, you know, the employment time period for most people was about nine months. I lasted two years there, right? And then years later, I went back and got my master's degree in counseling, and I got a job with teenage sex offenders in a similar treatment center. And I've talked about how dysfunctional the treatment center is and all of these things. But you could say that about all of these organizations. But these kids, if you met these kids, you would be like, oh, my God, I hope somebody locks that kid up, right? And if you read their history and you knew what they had done, you would want them locked up. But they were, you know, kids that were abused. You have all these QBs and all these people that, you know, oh, yeah, we got to stop kids from being abused. Sure, right? You're just focused on Jeffrey Epstein and and Ghislaine Maxwell and all those people. That's all you care about because that's all you know. And that's just some little Internet thing that you do to be upset about something. But you're not going out there and, you know, fighting against this stuff that's happening on a daily basis to kids that end up in treatment centers and, you know, in the criminal justice system. And by the time they're adults, you would want no part of them. And then they're abusers themselves, right? And so, like, it's a, you know, it's a much bigger picture than all these dopes, all these QBs that, oh, yeah, let's save the children. You don't know anything about it, right? You're just sitting there on your computer getting outraged because somebody, so you saw a video or someone told you about this stuff. But it's happening in your town. It's happening everywhere. I mean, it's a, you know, there's a, pandemic of abuse and depravity. It's even happening in your own home with your kids watching porn and stuff, right? Every kid on the internet's watching porn and they're being negatively affected. It's a form of sexual abuse. And so you don't know anything about it. Like, you you know, and everybody who works in these treatment centers are negatively affected. Like I was negatively affected and be in this environment and just understanding how dysfunctional our system is and how many kids are suffering, how many people are suffering. This is just in America. It's probably much worse in other countries where there's more poverty and more governmental abuse and, you know, less oversight. And so when the system gets involved, when social service and DSS gets involved, they don't make things better. I mean, they can, but they go into these criminal families, people who are oftentimes suffering and, you know, psychological issues, drug use. I mean, I was in an outpatient clinic and there was the same thing, right? And it's depressing if you knew how bad it was and you don't. Like, so just shut the F up, right? 
you don't know anything about it. Don't like, you know, think you know something because you've watched a couple of videos and you've read a couple of articles and, you know, and you're going to compare me to Bob Saget, right? Like, <laughs> I'm saying this because people write ignorant comments all the time where they think they get triggered by some, he, you know, you're, you're zombifying kids. Well, I, you know, I had, I was against it. I talked to the, the psychiatrist and I said, you know, these drugs are just turning these kids into zombies. And then, you know, he didn't want to hear anything about it because that's his job. Psychiatrists are doctors who are, you know, specified in the field of psychiatry and, and mental disorders. And mostly what they do is prescribe various type of medications that have to do with, you know, psychological medications. And they're very powerful medications. Most of them have severe side effects. Some of the side effects are depression and um, suicide or suicidal tendencies or ideation. And so it's just an, an effed up system. And it's just one small part of an overall effed up system. And there's people out there, frontline workers are dealing with the dregs of society, you know, either in prisons or you know, cops or whatever it might be, and everyone gets down on them, but they have to deal with things that, you know, most of us don't even want to think about, right? And so, you know, <laughs> only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano, definitely reporting for the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.